welcome to uh, the new symposium organized by Moshtaba. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk very long. I'm just going to hand it over to Moshtaba um, and to all the presenters. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this session that we would like to discuss briefly about application of non-invasive brain stimulation in the field of numerical and mathematical cognition. So basically, we, there will be four talks um, that we start with Christina. Hand over to you. Hello, everybody. Um, one moment. So. I would like to present you a series of uh, TCCS studies we conducted in Tübingen. And this is all about um, brain stimulation studies in arithmetic. And for the background, I would, uh, yeah, I would like to say arithmetic is represented in a frontoparietal, mostly frontoparietal network of the brain. So usually whenever you calculate with numbers, you, um, yeah, in the brain, there are areas activated in frontal um, and in the parietal. So, and the question is a bit, are all these like necessary to conduct arithmetic or what, uh, um, components are um, represented where in the brain, actually. And we used one task for several studies, and I would like to show you the task first. So we have here a problem, an arithmetic problem to be solved, addition problem, two-digit um, numerical uh, stimuli, and you need to choose um, one out of two solution probes. So uh, in this case, uh, 73 would be the true answer to the problem. You need to choose this instead of this. So you have a target and you have a distractor. And the task, um, in this task, several components of arithmetic are um, somehow relevant. So here, we have a task um, that either includes a carryover or not. Carryover means that if you calculate five plus eight in this, um, in this uh, example here, it's above nine. So you need to carry over one to the uh, decades. And in this example, you have a carryover. And here in this example, two plus three, plus three not. Um, this makes it more difficult to calculate addition problems. Due to the format of this arithmetic task, we have some other factors being relevant here. So um, first of all, the task was not really to, to like really solve it and uh, select the solution probe that fits, but it might be that in some cases uh, there was a uh, number presented that is only approximately like the same as you uh, would think of. So in this case, instead of like, uh, 73, uh, it's 74. So it's like plus minus uh, one to uh, three um, um, above or below the um, actual solution. So this means here in this case, the target is not identical to the solution. Here it is identical. So this makes it also a bit more complicated to choose it. And the third factor that is interesting in this case is the distractor distance. So the distance between the distractor and the actual solution or the target. So here in this case, it's really small. It's like within the same decade and only like, um, and we, we created it uh, like deviating from four to uh, nine uh, from, this, uh, 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 yeah, from this target. And in the other case, it's rather large. So it's in, in another decade. Um, and there you would say it's rather easily to say, okay, this is um, not correct. So I can choose uh, the correct target here in this case. So all these three um, factors are manipulated orthogonality, auto, uh, orthogonal, and it makes it more difficult, uh, the calculation whenever these are included. And um, so the first thing uh, Elisa and her colleagues did was doing an fMRI study with this task. 
And what they found was frontoporietal activation for all of these factors, but of course differing a bit uh, in the localization and in, in, in other areas that were included in this case. What they always found is bilateral IPS activation. So for a carry, also for a target identity and for the distractor distance effects. Um, and what was always found was like a frontal activation, a bit differing uh, depending on the component, but mostly like in the left hemisphere um, and sometimes also on the right. So what we can see here is that the representation of these three factors is relying on the frontal parietal network of arithmetic. But what we don't do not know uh, from like neuroimage imaging techniques like fMRI is if they are really needed uh, to calculate. So for example, the bilateral IPS activation, is it really needed um, for all these three factors? And this we wanted to investigate with the help of brain stimulation. So brain stimulation, because I'm now the first in the row, <laughs> I will introduce it a bit, a bit more. So for brain stimulation, uh, you use um, electrodes uh, to stimulate um, yeah, the brain. And we locate them in or, um, over the target areas. So um, we located them on parietal or frontal cortex. And we used either TDCS, direct current stimulation, applying a, like a small current um, to these um, areas, or random noise stimulation, which means that the frequency um, is, um, yeah, it changes all the time the pol pol um, polarity. So it's not that you just have anodal or cathodal stimulation going in the one or the other direction, but you change it all the time um, according to a like, um, noise uh, distributed frequency here. Um, so, and what we did in this series of studies, we applied um, the following stimulation protocols. So for TTCS, we used one milliampere and the conditions anodal, cathodal, or sham, which means like pseudo stimulation for the duration of 20 minutes. For TRNS, we used like active or sham stimulation and in the frequency range, which is rather high because this is more or less referring to more excitability of the cortex. And the amplitude was between like minus 0 0.5 and plus uh, 0 0.5 million pairs. Um, as target areas, we defined um, um, the regions um, like adjacent to the IPS, which is like P3, P4 in the 1020 system, and also um, uh, electrode uh, positions above the DLPFC, like F3 and F4. As target electrodes, we used five times five um, uh, electrodes. These are like here, the smaller ones. And as reference electrodes for TDCS, we used the larger ones, like 10 times 10. And now, what are the results of this uh, stimulation? So first of all, we, um, bilateral parietal stimulation was conducted. What we found there was that distractor distance was manipulated by bilateral uh, TDCS application. And um, here you can see that it changes due to the stimulation. So sham as a reference point and anodal and cathodal did differ from each other here in this case. So what we can infer from this is that bilateral uh, representation in the IPS um, due, um, is somehow related to number magnitude processing. And this is what all the models in arithmetic processing talk about. So like bilateral IPS representation. For frontal cortex, these are only preliminary results. So um, they are not fixed yet, but first analysis show no stimulation effects on the three factors of interest here in this case. Maybe there is a main uh, effect of stimulation, but no modulation of the three effects um, components of arithmetic. 
The second point is, okay, bilateral IPS stimulation leads to differences in number magnitude processing. What about left or right uh, stimulation only? And what we can see here is on the left, we didn't find anything. So it really looked as if it's sham stimulation or pseudo -stim stimulation. There was no modulation in this case on our three factors of interest. On the right cortex, on the other hand, the carry effect was manipulated. So actually we found influences of right IPS stimulation on place value processing, what is related here to the carry effect. And then we used also TRNS to stimulate the parietal or frontal cortex. And if you compare these images a bit uh, to, um, to, uh, the, to the sham condition here in the middle, you see that actually we found no real stimulation effects on the parietal cortex. What is somehow surprising because for TDCS we found effects for TRNS with this stimulation protocol not. On the other hand, for frontal TRNS, we also didn't find like um, simple uh, modulations of the three factors. In, um, but what we found was an effect uh, of stimulation on the interplay of these three factors. So it was a four-way interaction here in this case. And it means that probably there's something going on with strategy choice planning or something else um, for, for, for domain general frontal areas in this case. So, to uh, summarize our findings a bit is like we applied different kinds of stimulation protocols to the same paradigm and found differential effects on these three factors of interest. So we found uh, that parietal TDCS bilaterally applied influenced the distractor distance effect, while right um, stimulation in the parietal cortex influenced uh, the carry effect. On the other hand, we found no influence of TRNS on the parietal cortex on these three factors, um, but frontal modulations were somehow um, apparent to all of the factors, so um, a bit more uh, general. So to summarize the findings a bit more uh, visually, um, we have that uh, we, we could say that the bilateral IPS is somehow subs, uh, yeah, um, subserving number magnitude processing, um, while the right IPS is more or less relevant for place value processing, and the frontal cortex might be relevant for more general processes, something like strategy choice. And this is, I want to finish, I want to thank you for your attention and my collaborators on these studies. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think we will have time for maybe one question. Otherwise we can move to the next speaker and keep the discussion for the end of the session. Good, let's move to the next. Thank you so much. So next speaker is Roy. So hand over to you. Hello everyone, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, well, uh, thank you uh, everyone for um, coming and for the invitation to present um, in this symposium. So thank you very much, uh, Mostaba. Um, so I'm going to uh, tell you about um, mathematical learning rather than performance on, a, on during a mathematical task and uh, the potential role of uh, attentional mechanism uh, to explain the results that we obtain um, with brain stimulation. So just to provide uh, one slide on, on financial disclosure um, that including a spin out, a patent and a consultancy. And I would like to, um, what I'm going to show actually is uh, a series of, of studies. I'm not going to get deep into the paradigms. I'm happy to, uh, to answer that, but it's, it's more to give you the story here. Um, so this is the first uh, study that we use uh, TRNS that uh, Christina already um, uh, explained about and showed really interesting results. And over there, what that we uh, found is that if we, uh, stimulate the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex during uh, five days of arithmetic training, 
two participants, we find that TRNS leads to um, better learning, both when the participants need to learn uh, items um, in uh, drill, using drill um, learning, or when they need to apply uh, calculation, so algorithmic learning. So this happened in both cases, and we found also that there is a long lasting effects. In this case, it was uh, specifically for calculation six months later. Now, this was done on healthy university students, and we also wanted to see if this could be expanded, uh, extended to um, children who have mathematical learning difficulties. And this was a, a pilot study run in a, in, in a school in London, a school for specific learning difficulties. And we gave to the kids there um, a, a numerical training, a gamified numerical training, while we stimulate again their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with TRNS. And um, among the different results that we found there, what it, uh, we observed is uh, that, again, TRNS led to better learning, so to a steeper sleep in terms of, sorry, um, uh, steeper slope uh, in terms of learning, again, for TRNS versus sham. And this also replicates other findings from my lab and other labs uh, showing the benefits of uh, TRNS on um, skill acquisition. Now, the, the question that we start to think is what could be the results of that at the cognitive level? And one of the potential explanation is that we might affect attentional uh, mechanisms. Um, we know that learning depends on um, attention. We, could, we know also the comorbidity between ADHD, for example, and uh, dyscalculia and, and other learning difficulties. And what that we want is to start to examine this uh, potential effect. At the neural level, we know that um, a certain uh, neurophysiological characteristics in terms of the brain rhythms, which is the ratio between theta rhythm and beta rhythm, is a biomarker for attentional control. And what it um, we uh, did in this in, in, in another study, and I show you the, the pictures of all the lovely uh, people that I worked with during this time, is that when we deliver TRNS, uh, we find, and this is to the prefrontal and parietal in this case, we find the TRNS um, reduce the theta beta ratio. So you could see, I don't know if you see my, um, my mouse, but you, you see my mouse, great. So on the, on the y-axis, you have the TBR ratio and the higher values indicates poor attentional control. You have three conditions here. Let for focus here just on the sham and one milliamp TRNS, which we applied in all the studies um, that I present to you. In the case of the kids, it was a bit lower. And you find that there is a reduction in the case of TRNS from uh, pre before we apply the TRNS that to the time that after we apply the TRNS in terms of the TBR ratio. Okay, so there is a reduction here. The different dots are the participants. This is a within subject design on uh, 72 participants. So it seems that uh, TBR reduced the, sorry, the TRNS reduced the TBR um, in this case. And this was during a sustained attention task. If you also look on the results from this task, you see that there is an effect also at the behavioral level. So here on the, val on the y axis, it's a coefficient of variance is how, um, if whether the results of the participant is really homogenous in terms of their uh, reaction time. So if someone is really focused on the task, you would expect that there will be less variability in terms of their responses. Okay? It's a well-established indicator in the sustained attention literature and lower values indicates that there is a more homogeneity in this case. What you could see is that uh, the effect of sham between uh, if you have before the before TRNS was applied to the time that you apply TRNS doesn't matter, but there is an effect when you applied one milliamp TRNS. What you could see also is that it depends on the TBR 
ratio. So this it's part of a moderation analysis. I'm showing you here high TBR and low TBR, which is one uh, standard deviation above and below the mean. You could see that the effect was found for those with high TBR that are indicated by poor attentional control. You could see it here, for example, in the performance on the sham. Those who have high TBR perform poorer than those with low TBR, but the benefits of those who receive the stimulation is um, really, I would say, remarkable. You could see that they take the, the level that they reach, it's uh, the same, if not even better, than those with low TBR. So TRNS seems to influence both um, their uh, brain um, rhythms, but also their performance on attention or control tasks. If this is the case, you would expect that if we will apply the same thing that we do in the case of mathematical learning to children with ADHD, um, then you will find improvement in terms of their ADHD symptoms. And uh, this, is a, this is a clinical uh, trial that we run in a hospital. And we found that indeed TRNS leads to better effects in this case than TDCS. But this is also a replication of that showing that TRNS compared to sham leads to a decrease in um, ADHD RS scores that indicates the symptoms of the kids. You could see the baselines before the TRNS was applied. Uh, immediately after, you could see the reduction in the case of TRNS compared to the sham and the effect three months later that there is, a, sorry, three weeks later that there is a sustained effect for TRNS in this case. So again, indicating that they might, that when we applied TRNS to the, the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it might affect arithmetic learning via effect on attentional control. Now, looking on it more directly, uh, we applied TRNS while people um, learn arithmetic, um, sorry, they, they were, uh, they had an arithmetic learning task. What did we found um, in the EG is that uh, there is an effect on um, N1. You could see it here. So this is TRNS compared to sham. There was an effect on the uh, FZ um, electrodes. And you could see that there is an, um, an effect on N1 that is indicator of um, an attentional uh, processing. In addition, I showed you the effect of TBR. And again, here, this is the performance on the arithmetic task. You could see that you have here a reaction time. These are normalized uh, log in this case because of the data. And you could see that the effect that you find of TRNS in uh, blue versus sham is um, specifically in the case of um, those who have poor um, so higher TBR, which is indicator of poor attentional control. Again, very similar to what we found with the sustained attention that TRNS will improve, in this case, arithmetic learning in those that at the neurophysiological level um, are associated with um, an indicator of poor attentional control. So to summarize, I showed you that um, TRNS over the prefrontal cortex can improve um, mathematical cognition. So in this case, arithmetic learning in healthy adults or numerical uh, training, uh, basic numerical skills in children with uh, mathematical learning difficulties, that uh, the effect is modulated by neurophysiological markers of attentional control, and that um, the same protocols that we apply to improve mathematical cognition is actually beneficial for those who uh, perform attentional task or for populations who suffer from attentional deficit. And last, uh, the, the last results from uh, mathematical uh, training shows that the effect of TRNS depends on neurophysiological markers that um, are involved in attentional control. So these are all uh, together provide some evidence that uh, the effect that we find of TRNS on um, um, during mathematical learning task is um, due to the involvement of attentional control. Of course, we're looking to do more experiments in that in order to provide uh, stronger evidence. I would like to thank to my collaborators and to uh, current and previous lab members. And
thank you very much uh, for your attention. Great, thank you so much for the very timely <clears throat> presentation. So we have time for um, for one question, if there is any. If there is not, we move to the next, next speaker, which is myself. Uh, let me just share my screen then. Okay, do you see my screen? And I suppose you can hear me as well. Yeah, all fine. Thank you. Okay, um, what I'm going to uh, present today is um, about the um, using brain stimulation or specifically TDCS um, to modulate the association between math anxiety and math performance. Basically, it's, um, um, it's a register report which has been accepted in Cortex uh, and uh, the stage one can be, is available online. If someone is interested, I can post a uh, link to that. And um, for someone who may not be still familiar with the register report, which is, register report has two stages. Stage one when is the time that we submit the introduction and method section with all details to the journal. And um, as soon as it's accepted conditionally, which is called in principle acceptance, we are allowed to conduct the study. And regardless of the findings, the paper will be published. So this is the path that we um, went through for this study. Okay, a quick background, um, math performance. We know that different cognitive processes including working memory, has um, some um, influences on mathematical performance and also um, emotional status or emotional factors might influence on our performance in mental calculation. But we also know that from some other fields that, um, for example, anxiety can, um, let's say, interrupt our cognitive processes, in this case, math performance, directly and indirectly through some other cognitive processes. Here is, as an example, is working memory, which follows the processing efficiency theory uh, by, uh, by Isaac and colleague. But we were thinking that maybe math anxiety might interrupt math performance through another uh, interruption of other emotional processes. So beside those, those things that we know from literature, we also know that um, stimulation of dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex would lead to improve working memory performance. And also somehow the same stimulation would help us to regulate our emotional um, responses. And what else we know is that, um, as Roy just um, explained to us, that brain stimulation, in this case, those lateral prefrontal cortex uh, stimulation would lead to improve in math performance. So putting all those knowledge together, we were just thinking that maybe um, we can investigate the influence of math anxiety on math learning or on the um, stimulation effect on math learning, let's say training, um, through do these two passes. One, through the changes in uh, working memory due to stimulation and also um, emotion regulation as well. Again, changes in emotion regulation. Okay, so here, basically we are not looking at those um, processes as an statistic or static processes, but rather the changes due to training or at the same, or let's say stimulation. We recruited a um, large sample of um, 89 uh, participants. They are um, healthy students. 
Um, we investigated a couple of um, questionnaires. We investigated meta anxiety, test anxiety, st um, state, and trait anxiety, and we used uh, brain stimulation it, it, and in, a in a crossover design using sham and um, sham or fake stimulation and real stimulation. And then, um, as other colleagues already explained, so um, we we put the um, anodal electrode on F3, as you see in this picture, which would be left prefrontal cortex and cathodal on, on the right side, and used one milliampere current and a rather, rather um, huge area. And for real ex, um, stimulation, we, used, we stimulated the brain for half an hour, and in a, in a fake or sham condition, it was only 30 milliseconds at the beginning to just give a sort of impression that there is something going on, but then we turn it off. And um, as regards the um, experimental tasks that we use during the brain stimulation, for working memory, we use two back tasks that they had to recall after a certain time. So whether the presented letter was matched or mismatched with two back of that, not one before, but two before that. Which is, which is testing and basically updating processes of um, working memory. For emotion regulation, we used IAPS. There. So we presented different, um, different images to the participants and uh, we asked them to, to rate whether, whether they evaluated as neutral, positive, or uh, neg negative um, emotion that, that they received from each image. And then for math, uh, we used um, subtraction. So they observed one problem and then they had two choices they had to select to say which one was correct. And we did brain simulation during that, that half an hour where when the participant, they were completing all these three tasks. But of course we did write all those randomization and things to control for a um, couple of confounding effects. So um, as we stated in our register report, um, which I call confirmatory analysis, um, we observed no effect of stimulation on working memory, no effect of a stimulation on math performance, no effect of a stimulation on motion regulation. However, it was all at the time that we didn't control for stimulation order. As you may remember, the design was crossover, which means that half of the participants, so they came to the lab two times, half of them in the first session received real stimulation and the other half received the sham and vice versa in the second session. Okay, so basically we, we have this, um, this huge probably order effect. So we put the order effect into the model and everything changed. Basically, huge effects of brain stimulation on working memory, huge effects of stimulation, particularly on RT, um, as regards the math task, and huge effect of um, brain stimulation and emotion regulation, particularly as K in the case of down regulation of negative um, feelings, basically. Basically, with controlling with that order of the stimulation, we could see clear pattern of um, positive influence of the stimulation on those performances, basically. So coming back to our plan. So um, what we planned in that register report, we unfortunately didn't include order effect to be controlled as a confound, okay? Because of that, I go through two paths. Basically, one is confirmatory and the other is exploratory, where we added order effect. As you, you, you saw already, it's a, it's a very huge confound, basically. So what we observe as regards those associations, um, the only association that we observed without controlling for order effect was the association between working memory and math, which was 
huge effect, but there was no um, total effect. I mean, total effect without those moderators between math anxiety and changes in math performance and nothing between math anxiety and the other changes. But after adding the um, order effect to the model, something changed basically. So this um, association got um, significant. What does that mean? That means that math anxiety um, interrupts the stimulation effect, the positive effect of brain stimulation on working memory. But still, it, um, it doesn't have any interruption effect, let's say, on changes in math performance and changes on um, regulation of emotion. And, um, and still, that effect was significant. And um, the, the association between emotion regulation and math performance, all those changes um, slightly got significant. Let's say there was a tendency here, as you see. What could we conclude from those findings? So first, again, confirmatory, which means without controlling for, for the order. So there was no effect of stimulation, which may not be necessary true message of this study. Um, and no, because there was no effect, so no interruption of math anxiety. And math anxiety had no direct or indirect effect on improvement of math performance due to stimulation. But the more real, let's say, result is this, which is still exploratory, but I think it's worse to um, take this message actually over the other one, is that bilateral dorsolateral prefrontal cortex stimulation led to improvement in working memory, in math performance, and also down regulation of negative emotion, which is pretty exciting, I would say. And math anxiety, however, only interrupts the stimulation effect on working memory. So basically in that huge association or mediation analysis, math anxiety had no negative or positive or any effect basically on the changes in math performance and emotional regulation. So basically what we can say is that um, those changes that we observed or stimulation effects, which were pretty good, um, were not influenced by math anxiety. So basically the take home message could be that um, well, while brain stimulation has very good influences on performance, um, it doesn't change the association between math anxiety and math performance. And one technical um, conclusion is that um, don't forget adding order effect into your model when you're planning to, to do a register report or to analyze your data in this sort of crossover studies. And I would like to thank uh, my collaborators, Christina and um, Hans Christoph Nurk, for this um, exciting work. Um, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Is there any question? Yeah, Roy. Um, Roy, you are muted. If, if no one asking, I can ask one. Um, so it, it, it was um, quite. I was quite interested uh, to see that uh, you look on the effects on on the on TDCS on math um, at, at least at the beginning without taking into account anxiety level because we found that um, it depends on your anxiety, on your math anxiety. Uh, what was the reason of having a register report without taking this into, into account? By the way, I just have to say that we also put their order as a covariate in, in that study. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, basically, the, we were honestly motivated by this study by you and Sarkar, so 2014. 
So uh, the, the origin of the, the motivation came from there. And you're right, yes, in your study, you report only the fact in high, um, um, highly anxious um, individuals. So this is, this we call, because it's a, it's a huge study in our register report, we have that analysis as well. So we refer to your study saying that because you found it in only high, highly meta anxious people. So we are going to do exactly the same analysis only in um, high quartile of participants. So, um, but we call it as additional. Um, so we, we have planned a couple of other studies. So today because of the time limit, so I didn't present everything. Um, but yes, this is, this is what we have. So we are excited about that. Most probably we will have, we should expect something more there. I haven't explored data, data um, in that specific group, but yeah, I will, I will do. This is in our register report. So, and we have to do that, we do it. <laughs> Thank you. At least a moderation, I think. You don't need, I think, to divide the data. It's maybe not the best thing, but uh, yeah, it would be interesting to take this into account. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, the last speaker is Jochen. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is always the first question, I guess. Yes. Perfect. And can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Great, thanks. So, well, thank you for attending and thanking Moshe for organizing this symposium. Um, my talk will be about the uh, transcranial accuracy simulation effects on procedural calculation and working memory, or well, the, the lack of effects to be more precise. And luckily, several things are already explained, so I can just dive into it. Why do you think it's relevant? Well, as we all know, I agree, I think arithmetic and mathematical abilities are important for everyday life, more or less essential for academic and professional success. However, they also pose a big challenge for many persons. There are, of course, persons suffering from dyscalculia, which has a prevalence rate of three to six percent. But even in the general population, there are over 22 percent of adults who show very poor arithmetic or math skills who can only perform simple step arithmetic operations or um, understand basic ratios and percentages. So interesting tools to improve that support disabilities or the acquisition of knowledge and abilities has been there for a while. And transcranial electric stimulation is a promising tool to achieve this. We can uh, modulate activity, we can try to modulate plasticity, and by that hopefully support processes and maybe even get a better understanding of the processes. At least that's the idea. And over the past two decades, there have been many studies, interest is steadily growing. Most of them have dealt with working memory or long-term short-term memory, and only a handful so far have been in the well, uh, area of arithmetic reasoning, arithmetic processing. Most of them we have heard right now in the past few talks. And the question always is what to target. And well, we can with transcranial simulation mainly target cortical regions, and there are several in, involved in arithmetic processing. Three of them have been a target of most studies so far. That's the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the intraparietal sarcus and angular gyrus in the posterior parietal cortex. That's because several MRI studies have shown that these regions are associated with specific strategies in arithmetic processing. So the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the IPS is, has been more, as, more associated with procedural calculation, angular gyrus more with fact retrieval. And this leads us to the second part of well, our research or the talk, which is the working memory. Um, working memory is, of course, a very important function for most cognitive processes and functions, and as such, of course, also relevant for arithmetic processing, quite likely, especially so for procedural calculation. And it's linked to basically the same brain regions with the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the IPS being seen as parts of the core network of the working memory. And it has been researched quite well with simulation studies, and especially anodal direct current stimulation targeting left dorsal prefrontal regions have a small but very reliable effect, which led us to some questions. At first, of course, the question, can we uh, use stimulation to improve or support procedural calculation processes or performance in these tasks? And secondly, 
to get a better understanding, are we really stimulating or enhancing demispecific or domain general functions? So meaning if we find effects on arithmetic performance, is it because we stimulate arithmetic performance or are we truly stimulating working memory and by that improve the arithmetic processes? And we had three studies who in part at least looked into this. The first one was a direct current stimulation study on additions and subtractions and working memory with um, double digit additions and subtractions with carry and borrow as procedural arithmetic tasks and a two pack working memory task with letters to assess working memory um, performance. Stimulation was online, meaning we stimulated during persons um, conducted this task. We had three blocks, one block of task before stimulation, one during, one after stimulation, you used another direct current stimulation in this study, targeting as a left dorsal prefrontal cortex and the left PTC. And sample were 62 persons separated in three groups, so the third group being the sham group, control group, and study were, of course, uh, double-blinded. And well, the results were not really um, great, to be honest. <laughs> we didn't find really any effect of stimulation on performance. The only thing we found was an interaction for calculation times and subtractions where we found that frontally stimulated persons showed a decrease in calculation times um, over the first two blocks, while the sham simulation showed a similar decrease, but only from the second to the third block. But overall, there were no differences between the groups. And for working memory, we didn't find any effects at all. So in the second study, we uh, had no working memory task, but we switched up the arithmetic task a bit and uh, took something a little bit more complicated and compared six different active stimulation protocols on the effects on uh, a version of pound arithmetic. In that case, persons were introduced to the uh, calculation for these problems beforehand. So if you see a problem like four hashtag 36, you have to calculate 36 times two minus the first minus the four plus three. So the result of this would be 71. And persons were introduced to this well, kind of algorithm and trained so that they can, could conduct it before we started the task. And then we had five blocks of arithmetic tasks, mainly consisting of problems like this that never repeated. So participants had to always calculate them. A small part was repeated rather often. That was the fact retrieve, a fact learning part of the study, but from the procedural section uh, part of it, this was the task. Stimulations were uh, unknown TDCS theta and alpha band alternating current stimulation. Targets were the same as before, those are prefrontal cortex and PTC. And stimulation was again online, meaning we stimulated during the person's work on the second and the third task block of five. Sample were uh, 137 persons separated in seven groups, the seventh group being the sham group, again, a double, blind, uh, double blinded uh, study design. And yeah, well, the results were same as before, we didn't find any stimulation effects on accuracy, and we didn't find any stimulation effects on calculation times. However, on a positive note in this, we also had the fact learning part in the study, and there was there were several uh, nice beneficial effects. The best of them probably uh, frontal feeder band stimulation improved the repetitions needed to learn new novel facts by over 20%. That's also the reason why we took this stimulation for the third study. Uh, basically, uh, very similar to the second one. Difference is it's in a multi session setting, so we had the same arithmetic task as before, but the five blocks are now separated on five days. And we also included working memory again. Again, a two pack task with letters, like in the first study. This task, however, was only conducted at the first and the last day. Stimulation over these five days happened on days two to three. It was again online, meaning during participants worked on these tasks. And as said, it was the frontal uh, feeder band stimulation that we used for it. Sample were 25 persons in the active group and 23 in the sham group, again, double blind. And I guess by now you probably can expect the results. We again, didn't find any effects on procedural calculation leader and calculation terms, non accuracy. And we also didn't find any effects in working memory reaction times or accuracy at all. So well, this means we didn't find any improvements. So our stimulation protocols didn't work at all for these two tasks, which also means, of course, we can't answer the question if we stimulate general or specific domain specific tasks uh, processes because there are no effects. Um, which leads us to a question on why, because in several prior studies, there were effects and we have heard it in 
here before from different angles and different stimulation protocols. One thing might be that we use online stimulation in these studies, and there are some recent results that show or indicate that offline stimulation, meaning stimulation before a task block or in between two task blocks, might work better, at least for working memory. And it would also be for a calculation in line with earlier work from colleagues Hauser and Rutsche, who found procedural calculation effects using TDCS when they stimulated before or in between tasks. Second thing is TRNS. We uh, heard it before that this worked in several studies and might also be better suited for working memory. I'm not sure about calculations, but there are some studies from Graph, for example, who found quite good effects with this. And the last thing is that just might generally be probably better supported in learning. And this is also something our studies indicate with the effect on fact retrieval learning, effect learning in the second study, and the slightly improved um, training gains, if you might say so, in the first study. So it might be that electric stimulation in general might be well, support, well uh, useful in supporting learning, less so in supporting performance, especially in procedural calculations. Well, we are working on other studies so far, so maybe I can show you some better effects next time. For now, I want to thank you for listening and to my colleagues for working with me on all these studies. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jochen. Um, so I think we can um, open stage to everyone or anyone who has questions to any of the speakers or general discussion. If not, I may ask a question to... Uh, I have a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> referring to your study, uh, thank you very much. I was wondering, um, I mean, it's a, it's a bit, bit of a mean question, but given that these order effects seem to be very strong, why did you not uh, consider them in the first place? Uh, that's a very good question. It was a mistake, <laughs> being honest. So we, we didn't take it that serious. Despite I remembered very well um, in the Sarkar study um, that they had significant order effect there as one of the effects that they report in the paper. So, um, but at that time we didn't, I don't know why, but in the end, definitely because of a mistake. So we, uh, we didn't take it so serious. And unfortunately, none of the reviewers <laughs> pointed it out to us to be included. Can I, can I say one point about it? So actually, um, we tried to counterbalance it across subjects. So actually, it was really counterbalanced. So that half of the subject started with this and the other half with the other stimulation. So our hope was that it's never, yeah, that it's in the end, um, yeah, matched somehow. So this is why we didn't control for it as in other designs where you, yeah, where it might not be counterbalanced, but probably still but the, there are some yeah. interesting points. Exactly. And, and the point is that, you know, the, because they did somehow the same task two times, right? One with a stimulation, one without. So basically, um, it seems that regardless of the stimulation from one, time one to time two, there was a huge learning. This is something that we didn't expect that that, that would be that huge. With all those counterbalancing that, that Christina explained. Yeah, Roy. Yeah, I just want um, to um, th thank you and, and, and ask him a question. Um, did you try to look, so first of all, very interesting line of research and you know, really well, well done also for reporting the denial results. I wonder, did you have a look on any moderating effect that might be in your data, given that you also have such a large sample and there are so many experiments showing that just give one type of protocol to all the people, we're not going to affect them. Um, and, and I wonder if you had a look on that. Well, well we um, we plan, we no, have no, it. I, I, oh, no, to... Mostafa, I, 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 I ask Johan. To Johan, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, thanks, thank you for your words, and uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we didn't look in all 
too many moderations. What we did do was for the alternating current simulation that was individually adjusted. So for TDCS, we used uh, one for all simulation with one milliampere for 25 minutes. The alternating current simulation was individually adjusted. So we um, had persons indicate when they feel some tingling effects or anything unpleasant beforehand and adjust intensity to that. And we measured their individual alpha peak frequency and adjusted the stimulation frequency in alpha and beta bands to that individual alpha peak. For other moderating effects, we um, only looked into some of them in the last study where we are currently um, analyzing um, the effect learning part and the MRI part of it. And for procedural effects, we didn't find all too much moderating effects. We did find some effects of gender for the fact, uh, sex, basically, biologically, for uh, fact learning persons with larger effects in men than in women. But in other uh, moderating variables, we didn't look into it yet. Have you any especially in mind, or we're thinking about a moderator we could have measured? Arithmetic abilities, we find in several studies that it is a moderating effect. Yes, we, we um, have some, well, basic measures of arithmetic ability, unfortunately not really extensive ones, but for the procedural effects, we didn't find any uh, influence of those, at least nothing that changes the results overall. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? If, if nobody has uh, a question, I have a question for you, Moshtaba. Um, yeah. So I'm, not, I'm a lot more familiar with behavioral data. Um, so your findings when, when you control for the order effect, what does it mean on a behavioral level? Am I correct in saying or in thinking Matt's anxiety, the link between Matt's anxiety and Matt's performance is in some way mediated by working memory, or am I just completely misunderstanding the data? Um, no, no. Um, basically, in that data set, we, are, we found no association between math anxiety and changes in math performance. Uh, we are talking about the changes, right? Not about like one session measurement. So mm. you know, basically, there was no effect, no neither direct nor um, indirect effect between math anxiety and changes in math performance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, finding it hard to, to wrap my head around uh, the findings, but yeah. All right. Yeah, it's it's a little bit too much findings, basically, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I could imagine that it's not so easy to digest all. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? If not, then I think we can end the session. So I'm sure if you have some questions, you can still um, get in touch with the presenters. I'm sure they're happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you to Mushtaba for uh, organizing and to all the presenters for the great presentations for today. Uh, and I think that next week we have some lightning talks coming up. Um, so make sure to join us on Friday for the lightning talks. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being there and for the feedbacks. Um, have a lovely day, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Ciao. Bye.